Hi, my name is Jeff Pagano and welcome to Harpin on Rugby. This is the 80 plus column. It's what I call a video newsletter where I have a weekly Wednesday waffle on things that are going on in Leinster, Ireland and the wider rugby world. Now, if you look here, you'll see a list of topics and I basically hope to spend the next half an hour harping on them. So let's get cracking, shall we? The first heading you see there is uh, missing links. And um, basically, this is just a bit of housekeeping. For the past couple of years, our uh, website has been at uh, harpinonrugby.com before then it was at harpinandrugby.net. I'm not going to bore you with all the ins and outs of why we're making these changes, but basically from now on, the site domain is going to be harpinandrugby.blog. I'll just basically point at nothing here and hopefully in graphics later on, I'll stick that um, uh, domain name up on the screen. And uh, so it's harpinandrugby.blog from now on. However, because uh, when we started, we were um, an articles-based website. I do write-ups of all the Leinster games, and it was mostly written words. But for the past couple of years, we've been doing more podcasts, uh, videos like this, and uh, TikToks. So um, because that doesn't really suit a sort of a, sort of a written kind of a website, we're going to put our main uh, link at uh, Linktree. OK, so it's, as you can see there now, I put that up as well. The um, the new link is Linktree slash Harpin on Rugby. Um, so if you're going to bookmark our site, uh, please do that one. And if, well, first of all, thank you for bookmarking us. Um, but if you could change it was dot com, we were pushed and everything was Harpin Rugby dot com last season. That's finished. We're going to switch over now to Linktree slash Harpin on Rugby. All our latest podcasts, all our latest videos, all our latest TikToks, or any information we want to put up there um, will be on that site. Now, we're, we're going to keep the blog. We're going to, like, for example, video like this where I've got all kinds of different information from different stories, uh, any links or um, references or anything I need to su supporting materials will all be there. So if you want to follow up on something I've said here, I'll, I'll put everything I can on the blog. But basically, our main focus, because we're we're doing pods and videos and TikToks, it's going to be on Linktree. So please bookmark that if you can. Okay. That's enough of the housekeeping. Um, uh, except for this next bit where we're going to start, we officially announce our, uh, what I call my pod squad. I hate it rhymes. I just went with it. Okay. Um, we, do Leinster raps. We do rap pods of Leinster matches. Uh, that's our main thing. Okay. So Leinster play on the Friday or the Saturday or the Sunday. And then on Sunday evening, um, I invite two of, from the pod squad on to help me just go back over the game and talk about it and, and see what we made of it. Um, so it's, we, we do that every week. Um, I've got a great squad of contributors uh, to help me do it throughout the season. And um, we're going to have hopefully uh, 10 in future in, in total uh, to choose from for our Leinster matches this season. And we've other contributors as well. We some from all the other provinces when we're playing other provinces or for Ireland matches. We, we try to mix it up with uh, contributors. But this is the main group of, of 10 names, as you can see there. Now, there's one at the end there. It says to be confirmed. We've got a new contributor, uh, hopefully starting uh, in a couple of weeks. So we look forward to that. Uh, we're going to have our season six premiere where we're basically looking ahead to the upcoming campaign and we'll reveal our new uh, contributor there but you can see them all there kigo connor tom mark rich uh kino kieran jay and david joined us towards the end of last season david cordial he'll he'll do too and he's actually joining us for that season six premiere as well but he's going to be the veteran in that pod we'll have a, a, a someone making their harp and debut so i'm really looking forward to that uh, like i say season six premiere uh, pod is going to record on set on sunday september the 15th Okay, so look, look ahead to that. Okay, so that's enough on the missing links and uh, the pod squad. And we move on now to our regular feature, which we call the front five, which is a selection of five eye-catching, egg-chasing quotes and links from around the rugby media landscape. And our first article this week comes from what I call the mothership. It's irishrugby.ie. It's the IRFU website. And they've got big celebrations coming up this season. The uh, headline reads, uh, Ireland, Ireland, IRFU launches 150th year celebrations for the 2024-2025 season. Now, this is an amazing um, uh, milestone. Uh, it's the 150th anniversary of Ireland's inaugural men's international rugby match, which took place between Ireland and England on the 15th of February, 1875. And of course, on the 1st of February, uh, 2025, um, we're playing England as well. So there's, there's lots of, it's, it's a great excuse to just to celebrate Irish rugby. Obviously it hasn't all been perfect. And one of the things we do here at Harper on rugby, if we see something we don't like, we say it and we just put it out there and we try to get opinion from fans. There's a lot to be done in a lot of different areas, 
But overall, uh, we love the game, and uh, this the RFU runs the game in Ireland, so um, it's definitely worth celebrating overall. And uh, we'll see what they do now. They're bringing out um, they're they're bringing out a special commemorative jersey. I, you know, we'll see what that looks like. Is it worth buying or whatever? This we were already spending a lot of money on new jerseys as it is, but this is part of the celebrations. I'm sure they'll have um, other events. A lot of it's uh, in this article, so be sure to check it out. And we we'll, we we'll look ahead to the season. Okay, uh, second article this week. Is called uh, Cleaner Speaks. That's my headline. That's my uh, title for it. Um, and this is, um, we were talking about, you know, not everything was perfect with the IRFU. Well, I think this is a perfect, this is a really perfectly important article for uh, Irish women's rugby in particular. And uh, this is from RTE.ie. Uh, the headline reads, uh, Kleena Maloney, Ireland set up now worlds apart from the old days. Now, if you don't know who Kleena Maloney is, uh, she's uh, she's a hooker for um, and she played in Ireland and she was an she was an Ireland cap. And it, you, you don't need reminding that just, you know, two, three short years ago, Ireland women's rugby was in an awful state, um, having been so good uh, about 10, 11 years ago. Um, it just declined. And the, the, there was. You know, there was issues over the conditions. There was issues over the the, the time the players had to take off from their work to, to play. And uh, when you compared the Irish, the conditions in the Irish team to uh, women's team, to teams like, you know, programs in England and France and other kinds of stuff, it just wasn't matching up. We weren't progressing at the same rate. And um, the headline or the quote I've taken from this article is uh, Kleena Maloney made headlines in November, 2021, when she was critical of the IRFU's then head of women's rugby. Now, um, did that mean she was exiled from the Irish team? It was never officially announced that she was, but let's just say since then she wasn't picked. And uh, there were squads and squads, squads uh, picked for Ireland and she wasn't in them. And uh, she went over to England and she went to the premiership there. She played for Exeter and she's tearing it up there. She, every week she's making headlines for great performances, but yes, she still wasn't getting picked, but listen, so now that, and then earlier this season, she was selected again. That was great, but I think we needed this extra step again. So now she's been it, back in the Irish national system. And I think this article is very important. And what she has to say does mean a lot. And uh, this article there, she, she does say that things are getting better. I think this is a very important step on the road to things getting better for Irish rugby. And there's a lot to look forward to. They're playing the Wallabies in a couple of weeks, um, the national team, and then they're going on to the WXV1 tournament where they're going to play uh, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and the USA. So some big matches, Six Nations next year as well, the World Cup, lots going on. I think this is a really important um, focus, uh, and, and it shows that that things are improving. There, there, there will always be issues. There's issues with the, the provincial game we just had the women's interpros finish we'll talk a bit about that later um and then the club level that you know that it needs still needs work to be done but it's going in the right direction and i think that's important to stress and this article helps do that okay so that's enough for that um third article this week uh, my title is called curry favored um this is an article from rugby365.com and uh, the headline is curry cup knocks uh, urc into next year now, this is an announcement that was made on Tuesday. Um, we, we're, we're you know, looking forward to the new season. The United Rugby Championship kicks off in just a couple of weeks. And, um, you know, the first weekend, there's 16 clubs. Uh, there's eight matches in every round. So for the first weekend, you want all those teams playing. You know, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it, you look forward to seeing all the teams and every team getting off the ground. The problem is that is also the weekend of the Curry Cup final, South African provincial final. So the four South African teams in the URC, they also have teams in the Curry Cup. There's a lot of crossover of players and um, we'll be dealing with, we'll be talking more about the Curry Cup later in this video. But the point is that there is a clash. Now I'm thinking, why couldn't they have sorted this out a long time ago? Um, I really don't understand the problem. But anyway, listen, there was South African Derby scheduled for the for the first day of the season. Originally, the Stormers were due to take on the Bulls in Cape Town and the Sharks were due to host the Lions in Durban. But the thing is, those teams are generally at the top end 
of the uh, Curry Cup table. So they're, they're, there's likelihood two of them are going to be in the final. So it's not really fair on them to expect them to play such an important game. It's the oldest uh, competition. It's, it's loads of history in uh, South Africa. They want to play that game, but they don't want to be left behind. They don't want to, uh, they want to give it, put everything into every round in the URC because points are very important uh, come the end of the season. So it was, it made sense for them not to clash, but for them to make this change so late seemed a bit strange to me, but anyway, it's happening. Um, so there will only be six matches on the first weekend and those two games will be moved probably to January or during the six nations window. So um, that the, they'll make, make up their games then. Okay. So that's our third article. Now, fourth, we're sticking a bit more with uh, South African rugby here. Uh, this is a, a headline I've given for this is uh, greatest rivalry. Um, this is an announcement. Now we had the rugby championship last weekend. We're going to talk again about that uh, later. The Springboks, played the All Blacks, but of course, they they like to call that the greatest rivalry in rugby. I'm sure a lot of people would disagree, but it is a big rivalry, and that was a great match at the weekend. So now they've just announced that they're talking about actually um, expanding matches between them. And uh, down the line, starting in 2026, I think, they're going to actually have full tours of each other, um, uh, including three tests, four contests against URC clubs, and one match against South Africa A. So it's going to be a test series in South Africa, three tests be between the Springboks and the All Blacks and uh, and those other matches as well, the URC clubs. Now, obviously, those be great contests, great matches. It'd be a great tour to follow. A bit like the Lions tour, only just, you know, with All Blacks, but it's, it's like the old-fashioned tours used to be. On the surface, it looks great. But one person on Twitter I noticed mentioned that this isn't how does this affect – um, the other clubs in the uh, rugby championship. Uh, you've got Australia and Argentina. They they take place. So what what happens with them? Uh, do they play fewer matches? What you know? What what's going on with them when all this is going on? And it's a valid point. And um, we you know and we're supposed to be talking about world rugby um, making you know going with these national uh, world calendars. Um, supposedly more matches for the uh, lower tier teams against the top tier teams. This seems to be a step in the other direction. Now, in, in defense of this move, as great and all as South Africa and New Zealand are on the pitch, they're both really struggling for money off the pitch. I mean, fi things financially in Europe are reasonably good at the moment because we get good crowds to all the matches. But you look at these matches going on in South Africa and New Zealand, and they're, they're not all sellouts. Um, you know, they're, they're not getting week in, week out sellouts the crowds that we are in Europe and provincial rugby in Europe as well as test. So um, something like this would be a real lucrative uh, move and it would, would, would definitely uh, bring in good revenue, broadcasting revenue as well. Maybe they'll share that revenue with the other uh, uh, rugby championship clubs. I don't know, but um, it's, it, it just, it, it seems like a more regressive uh, kind of move uh, in many ways. So we'll see what happens anyway there. Okay. Um, that brings us on to our fifth article, which is uh, part of a series we have called a hog watch. Um, now, generally, our fifth article is usually our clickbait of the week. You could say this is clickbait, but I'm actually I'm going to leave that for this week. We don't have to do it all the time. But this is from um, the, a publication that we usually get our clickbait from. But this week, they've contributed to the uh, ongoing saga involving uh, Scottish international uh, Stuart Hogg. Um, we, we feature him every week because we're just I'm just fascinated how some uh, publications uh, treat his ongoing uh, legal situations in relation to his rugby. They I, I don't believe they can be separated. And in my opinion, he should just lay low. He shouldn't be in the media until his issues have been cleared. I fully accept that people are innocent. When they have a day in court, they're innocent until proven guilty. But you can't just pretend they're not happening either. And uh, this is a classic example of how an article just does that, okay? Um, this is an article from ruck.co.uk. The headline is, The verdict is in on Stuart Hogg's current ability weeks after shock return to rugby. Nothing in that about a court case at all. Wouldn't know it. And I'm telling you, you read the article from start to finish. And... There is not a single mention in the actual body of the article uh, about his court case. You wouldn't know it was happening. There is a, a tweet embedded in the article, right? And it's a tweet from, I think, a French news publication. And um, the tweet reads, in French, 
when you translate it, it says Montpellier's new fullback, Stuart Hogg, is accused of domestic violence by his ex-wife, Jillian. Okay, so there is a reference to it, but it's in French. So if you don't speak French and you looked at the article, you wouldn't know what's going on with them. Right. And there's a quote from Sam Simmons, um, also at Montpellier. Um, in the in the article where he goes a year out is not ideal and believe me this heat takes a bit of getting used to but this his time away could help him in the long run it's like i'm looking forward to playing with him again it's like my thing is is like are we absolutely sure he's going to be playing you know what i mean you don't know what's going to go on in this court case and stuff and my attitude would be just let it happen see what happens and then move on from there um, let him have his day in court. And, uh, you know, why are we talking as if it's not happening? That's that's my whole point. And that's why we have this ongoing series, Hogwatch. Uh, I think the, the 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 court case is coming up. I think it's on the 10th of September. I could be wrong, but we're going to be, we'll, we'll possibly have more on that next week. But that's that's our fifth and final Front 5 article. Okay. Okay. Now, next, we um, usually have what we call our Leinster squad update, where we've looked at uh, the uh, injuries, um, you know, the injury count from last weekend's Leinster game. Now, this time, we do have some Leinster rugby uh, to harp on because they did have a game uh, on Friday, their first a preseason match. They were in Bordeaux. Um, I... It, it was amazing the way it worked out. I was there uh, sitting in at home Friday evening. It, you know, there's nothing really going on. I knew the game was going to kick off. I was going to try to follow the scoreline on Twitter. But then all of a sudden, some tweets started going around that there was talk of it that was going to be appear on YouTube. So, of course, I had to drop everything, go to the website, try to find – um, is it, isn't it? There? But it turns out the, that uh, Bordeaux were showing the game live on their uh, YouTube page. So I got a link, I spread it around social media and it was good. And a lot of us got to watch the match live and it was brilliant. It was a great bonus. And we were dying to see Leinster rugby. Um, now, unfortunately, the result, the game didn't go so great. Um, but, you know, you have to take into account the, um, the different, the, um, uh, timing of the preseasons that the uh, top catchers, we're going to talk about that later on that actually kicks off this coming weekend. Um, so they were, so Bordeaux were just one week away from their new campaign, whereas Leinster had another couple of weeks. So we were two kind of literally two weeks behind in our preseason. And plus, so Bordeaux pretty much, they fielded two different 15s, one in the first half and a whole different 15 in the second half, but it was still most of their, um, their, their, their top squad. I mean, they had uh, Damien Penno, they had uh, Jalibert, they had uh, Billy Barry, um, Joey Carberry started the game the first half. It was their full lineup over the two over the two halves. Whereas Leinster, like obviously the, the, the elite players that we'd be playing in the Champions Cup and that were pretty much nowhere to be seen uh, with the exception of Ross Byrne. And in fact, you could say Ross Byrne made the difference uh, when the game, the, the way the game played out uh, from the kickoff, it was, Oh, Bordeaux. I mean, they just, they, everything they did worked. We could not get an attack going for Levner money. Now we started with Harry Byrne. I'm not saying it was all down to him. Like I say, we're still in preseason mode, but every attack just, it, it was a lost line out or a, just a, a knock on or an interception, um, things like that. We just couldn't get going where, uh, although we, we did take the lead. After I think it was eight minutes, it was uh, Rob Russell with a breakaway try. Um, but pretty much straight from the restart, um, Bordeaux were back and they they equalized and then they went ahead and it was try after try after try. There was a shambles just before halftime when we had a uh, there was a pass behind our try line. It was the, the kick was blocked and they just dropped on it and it was like twenty eight seven at halftime. Then the second half, like I say, Bordeaux completely changed their team. They put out fifteen and, and just on a sidebar, um, what they did is um, they actually gave their second half squad number 16 to 30. So it was easier for the crowd. When Leinster, Leinster haven't had home, um, haven't had a whole lot of home preseason matches, but what usually happen with these matches, you've got a second, you got a team coming on the second half with the same numbers as from the first half. And you got some players without any numbers at all. And this is a way of doing that. Just let the numbers go to 30 and beyond. So that the player, so that the fans can, you know, identify who's on the pitch, and this is what Bordeaux did. And uh, so I'm just saying that that's that's the suggestion. But anyway, on the pitch, things were still going bad for Leinster. Could not get attacks moving at all. It was all the other way. Um, they they went up, but there was by the start of the, the fourth quarter, it was uh, 40 to seven to Bordeaux. So they were kind of coasting at that stage. We just couldn't get any going. But then uh, Ross Byrne came on. 
And uh, I, I, I think it's pretty safe to say he made a difference. Um, we, we got our first try. We, we, we needed a couple of penalties to sort of get close to their line, but in a sh- close line out, uh, John McKee went over for our second try. And then right with the clock ticking down towards the end of, of course, it's a preseason match and you got players sort of taking the foot off the pedal in these games. Cause you don't, this is the last time you last place you want to get an injury that's going to affect your season. But we kept playing right to the end, in fairness. And uh, Andrew Osborne and Gus McCarthy nicked a couple of tries right at the very death to get the bonus point, I suppose. Final score was 40 to 28. A couple of things about this uh, production uh, by Bordeaux. First of all, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup uh, à Bordeaux for... um, for for this recording it was a great bonus for friday night got us back into the leinster rugby vibe again um and an an interesting thing they did was for every infraction for every knock on for every uh forward pass whenever the ref basically stopped the play for something they put up this graphic i'm going to show you this one here uh this is an example they put up a graphic on the screen and then it the, the screen then it changed to an explanation in french but an explanation of what happened and i i think that's a brilliant idea it did get a bit annoying because they did it for every time, every knock on, they put it up, right? So I, I think they might want to tweak that a bit and maybe just do it once for each infraction. And then when it comes up again, maybe just say knock on again. You don't have to go through the whole graphic and stuff, but it's still overall a good idea. We need, there's a lot of viewers of rugby who do like the game, but they don't know what's going on. And we, you know, it, it does help. It helps uh, explain to the public uh, what's going on in these games. So I thought that was a good innovation. But anyway, listen, Leinster, I was impressed with the way we, f- we played right to the end, but it wasn't a great performance. I did, a, um, I did a tweet at full time and I got a bit of backlash from it saying maybe I was a bit too negative. But, you know, I, I just try to call it as I see it. And I did point out that we are at different stages of preseason. So, listen, we're not going to dwell too much on, on, on that. But that, that was a overall great to see Leinster Rugby. I'm very grateful to Bordeaux for showing it. Okay. And, of course, we've got another game this weekend. Um, it's in Northampton. It's at Franklin's Gardens. We're renewing our um, r- rivalry, I suppose you could call it. We, we, came, we played uh, Northampton in the cha- Champions Cup semifinal in Croke Park. We're going back. We're going to Franklin's Gardens for a sort of return preseason. Again, they've got the premiership coming up, um, so, and they usually play more full strength games teams in these matches. But um, hopefully, uh, they're they'll be showing it somewhere YouTube or TikTok or something. So we'll see what happens there. Okay, so that's our Leinster uh, update for now. Now we get into our competition updates, and this is where we um, we look over all the other competitions. Um, apart from the URC Champions Cup, where we give our full uh, attention uh, th- in our pods, uh, here on these videos is where we're going to look at all the other competitions throughout rugby. And we're going to start with the women's interpros, which is good because Leinster are the champions for the second year in a row. They had a great uh, win over uh, Munster in the final at Kingspan Stadium on Saturday. It was an amazing display. Munster did take the lead after 11 minutes when McInerney ran ran right through our defenses from the halfway line. It was an amazing try. She just got past a lot of, you know, fast, uh, fast runners. You know, she did well. Uh, it was a great try under the post, 7-0 to Munster. We really thought we were under the cosh. Um, but just slowly, we just took control of the game. By 23 minutes, um, there was a loose ball at halfway, and uh, Tarpey um, – uh, took it, took the ball all the way to the line, uh, seven all. And then at the 25 minute mark, I think there was the key. Uh, I've been talking, I talked last week about Aoife Wafer. She's, I think she's back from injury. She hasn't featured in the starting lineup. She didn't start here last week against uh, Ulster. She came on at halftime and uh, immediately after the, the start of the second half, a jackal the penalty. And here she came on at 25 minutes, took her a bit longer. But um, having we, we went up, we got a penalty. Uh, Kali hit hit kicked a penalty to 10-7. But just before halftime, uh, Wafer just charged up the middle, passed tackles, and scored a try. It was 17-7 at halftime. And really, from there, it was uh, it was all Leinster. I mean, Munster did have a tr- um, have a chance. Uh, uh, they had a they got over the line. Uh, Dorothy Wall got over the line to 47 minutes. So that would have been huge, but there was no grounding. We got, actually got under the ball, but there was some amazing, I mean, he had, it wasn't just Aoife Wafer. There's another Aoife. I called it actually the tale of two Aoife's. Um, Aoife, Walt, Aoife Wafer and, and Aoife Dalton in the center. Her and Leah Tarpey, amazing uh, uh, 
center pairing. Um, there was Linda Jugang. There was uh, some amazing performances all over the park, but it was the team effort more than anything else that did it. And um, it was pretty clear in the second half that there was only going to be one winner on the day. And it completely overturned the result from another from a couple of weeks ago down in Cork, where Munster, Munster did win by a decent margin. But I said at the time that uh, Leinster um, did play well. I don't think that scoreline really reflected that game. But this scoreline of 27-7 did. And um, in fact, you know, it could have been even more. I thought Munster gave away a hell of a lot of penalties. And uh, there could have been a card at some stage. But listen, overall, great performance, uh, great victory. Uh, congratulations to Tanya Rosser and all the, all the players and everyone involved in, in an amazing display. And again, I'm going to say it's just a shame that this Leinster team, can we only get to see them play in the Leinster jersey for four weekends in the season. I wish they could do something about that. Um, I, I know it's difficult with all other tournaments going on, but I'm still saying it. I still think there's a demand. There's fans uh, of there's Leinster fans who love the branding and all four provinces. They would love to see their players more often. So hopefully they can do something down the line and get more into provincial fixtures. So that's the, and of course the, uh, the other, um, the other game that day, of course, was Connacht defeated Ulster to finish third place. So it was a great tournament all around. And uh, it's just a shame we have to wait another year for it to come around again. But listen, that's, that's, that's how things are at the moment. Okay. Next tournament, the top Cators kicks off this weekend. And as you can see there, I've got my little logo there. Um, I use emojis to do the top Cators. It's like top cat horse. Ha ha. Um, that's the way I always write the top Cators anyway. So listen, kicks off this weekend. Um, just in case you don't know the format, obviously there's 14 clubs in it. They play each other home and away. There's 26 matches. That's a hell of a lot of league matches. Uh, it's a very attritional season. The top six will go into the playoffs for the uh, uh, brand new uh, trophy. The top uh, two will go straight into the semifinals. And uh, the top seven or eight, depending on how things go, will go into the Champions Cup. And when it comes to relegation, the bottom team gets relegated and the 13th team uh, goes into a playoff with someone from Pro D2. OK, there's uh, some big matches in the first round coming up this weekend. <clears throat> but the one I suppose that stands out, well, Bordeaux plays Stade Francais. Um, but I'd say La Rochelle v. Toulon is a big match. And of course, Van against the Champions Toulouse as well. Uh, on Sunday evening, but uh, there's always a big deal when uh, the Top Cat Tours kicks off, and of course they're being shown on Premier Sports, uh, so check your listings for that. Um, there's, uh, the, the, it's a big weekend, lots of big matches starting there, and of course, moving on, we also been covering uh, the Pro D2. I'll go quickly through it this week, but they had their first round of matches last weekend. Uh, I say the feature match was the Breve against Oyanak, uh, and Breve won 18 to nine. Um, there's the full, you'll see all the results there. the The table after one round doesn't really. Mean Mean anything and of course the fixtures for next week that's the pro d2 we'll be following that throughout the season okay away from france now and we go into the rugby championship which had round three last weekend and um listen it was an amazing game uh, at Johannesburg, South Africa, New Zealand. I mean, New Zealand came out strongly. They went ahead. We thought they were going to win, uh, but South Africa fought back and they ended up winning uh, 31-27. And of course, the other game was a bit of a classic as well. Uh, Australia needed a kick right at the end of the game to win 20-19. to So that leaves South Africa out clear at the top. <clears throat> I said before the competition started that South Africa, with, with home matches against New Zealand, all the other three teams with new coaches, uh, reigning world champions, all those things, South Africa should be looking to win all six games. They That should be their target. Anything less than that might be considered a disappointment. And to be fair, I mean, that was a little bit of trolling, you could say, by me uh, saying that. But to, uh, to be fair, so far, they're three out of three. And um, no reason to think that they can't come back and do it again this weekend. But it's again, it's always a big match against the All Blacks. Now, um, speaking of trolling, we have a, um, a weekly feature here. Uh, called Troll Patrol, and uh, this week's version of Troll Patrol comes from this match, uh, where we, you know, we we cite a particular uh, person on social media or as an article, or whatever, for for basically contributing something specifically to gaslight um, uh, people online and stuff. And uh, you you may have heard a talking point from this from that match at Johannesburg about uh, double banking. It was all over social media. I won't go into the incident itself. 
Um, just to say that it looked like that the Springbok fans had their indignation uh, over that particular try, ready to go if the All Blacks had held on to their lead to the end. But instead, the home side came out on top. But why waste all that grievance energy? So the clips of that mall were being trotted out for days after the final whistle, which, of course, meant the Kiwis were bound to respond. And who better to do it than uh, Ben Smuth? Uh, not the former All Black fullback, but rather an opinion writer for RugbyPass.com. In his Twitter profile, he describes himself as undefeated against South Africa rugby Twitter. So you can see that he's pretty much uh, puts the trolling out. He's he's not afraid. He's not he's not he'd be proud almost of being called a troll in this case, and it says it all. And his contribution to the double banking debate was very simple. He just showed a picture of the Springboks allegedly doing the same in the same game, and I'm sure it got under the skin to the desired amount, which makes him this week's troll patrol detainee. Now, there's one more um, story from this um, uh, South Africa New Zealand match. I want to try. I want to go over, and it, I call it a cry over flyover <clears throat> before the game. Um, uh, a, a big jumbo jet, or uh, it's an Airbus, officially is the name of it, flew over the stadium and uh, they timed it. They seemed to time it, you know, just before the game started. But there was an issue afterwards because apparently the plane uh, flew over as the New Zealand was doing their haka. So it was kind of taking, it's a cultural uh, challenge. It's a, it's a, you know, it's obviously a big deal uh, to, to the, the All Blacks that they do this, perform this, and for a plane to fly over, I mean, it, it does seem to be like it's taking the piss a little, doing it at that timing. So the so the Springboks apologize for that, but I just think it was interesting. I've got I've actually have something to contribute to this story because um, about five or six years ago, I ended up I don't know how on a mailing list for African rugby. Now this is rugby from all over the continent. There would be some South African stories, but if there was something from the Kenyan Rugby Federation, from Madagascar, from any any country on the continent of Africa, I get these um, press releases. I, I tend to ignore them, but then when they pop up, I, I don't really, don't really read through them, but I, but I did get one since the weekend, which I thought was interesting. And it was, it was effectively written by the airline Emirates. This is, you know, the stadium is called Emirates Airlines Park now. And it was an Emirates plane that flew over the, uh, the stadium. And what they actually said in this press release, they said the Emirates A380 took off from O.R. Tambo International Airport at four o'clock, traveling at a speed of 140 knots, reaching the stadium at 1658, perfectly timed to follow South Africa and New Zealand's national anthems, right? So basically, they are in this thing, they're admitting that the plane was meant to fly over at that moment. I just thought that was a, an amazing admission. You know, they were apologizing, saying, oh, we didn't mean to this, that, and the other. But actually, um, flying over after the anthems was the point. And after the anthems comes the haka. So what did you think was going to happen, you know? But anyway, it's just... Just thought I'd put that out there. Um, that's just a bit of extra information. But listen, overall, great match. Um, and it looks like it's, it's the Springboks, a rugby championship to lose. Okay, so we'll see what happens in the next game. Uh, I think they're playing in Cape Town next weekend. Now, quickly, we move on to the Curry Cup. I'm not going to take too long on this. Uh, they had round nine. Uh, last weekend, there were some really big scores uh, this weekend. In fact, when I did, I did this thing, I, this is the way my head works. I summed up the average scores uh, in, in round nine of the Curry Cup. And the average, uh, the average score line was 54-28. Where I, when you, and when you compare that to the Pro D2 round one, the average score there was 22-16. So that says a lot about the style of play um, in Europe, in a second-tier Europe competition and a provincial uh, South African competition. Some big score lines um, in, in this round. I suppose the, the biggest, um, the, the Sharks beat the Griffins 75 19, but the biggest shock, I think, was the Bulls uh, going down 57-33 to the Lions, which really shook up the top of the table uh, in a big way. Well, at the moment now, that put the Lions in first place going into the final round of matches next weekend. Bulls second, Sharks third, and of course the big game this weekend, the final round of matches, you've got the Cheetahs in fourth place, 25 points, the Pumas fifth place, 24 points. They play each other in the last round on Saturday. That's obviously the big game. That's effectively a quarterfinal, so that'll be a big match. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. Now, 
it's time for what I call the squirrel clip, where I uh, check my phone to see if any news is broken while I'm recording. And in the meantime, I'll distract you with a one minute clip of actual rugby. Now, throughout the season, I'll probably include a clip of the most recent Leinster Ireland match. But this week, I want to go back to Ireland's Grand Slam in 2023. It was the decider against England at the Viva Stadium. And although Freddie Stewart had been famously sent off early on, the 17-9 scoreline after 67 minutes was a lot closer than we wanted to be. So when we won a penalty giving us a line out of the 22, we needed something special to get past the stubborn English defense. And this is where Jemison Gibson Park worked his magic. Going to the blind side, not once, not twice, but three times to see Dan Sheehan over. And that was the moment we could finally say the slam was done. So here's the clip while I do some scrolling. It's down on the floor there, and then all of a sudden, it's Ribbons. He knows exactly what he's doing. He can, you get away with it sometimes, but again, with this white hot atmosphere here, the referee touch judges, everyone's looking at it. Absolutely. Big moment. Born in Leicester, played for the Tigers. Backwards. Sheehan and Ireland's mall retreat, so the hooker who scored Ireland's first try comes away. And O'Toole, who's been a real fine Release, for Ireland in this Guinness Six Nations oh, takes it on another super pass from Gibson Park to Hansen which created the room for Sheehan and Ireland are beginning to motor Ryan Baird into lots of tacklers Jack Conan tries to get it away Sheehan oh that is wonderful that is wonderful Jack Conan the creator Dan Sheehan finish like a winner Ireland have their third try and more than one hand on this grand slam. Okay, we're back now. I just had a quick scroll there. I don't see anything. Of course, something will break as soon as I finish recording. Um, one thing I, I remember last week in this section, I, I said something about uh, Lewis Rezamit not being picked up by the Kansas City Chief. Turns out he ended up actually getting picked up in the practice squad for the Jacksonville Jaguars. So fair play to him. I I kind of, I was a bit smart last week. I said, oh, of course, you know, he's only just taken up the sport. Of course, he didn't make it. You know, he, it, it's a bit better than that for him, obviously. And he's done, he's worked really hard uh, to, to try to get into squad. And he has made it into the practice squad for an NFL team, which is an amazing achievement. Um, we'll see how he gets on. I wish him all the best. There is talk. There are, there are starting to be stories about uh, what his plans are for the future, that he does plan to maybe return to rugby in time for the next World Cup. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But we do, you do wish him all the best in what he's doing. Okay. Um, so. We're going to leave it there. Uh, all going well. Uh, we'll be back next week. We'll be looking ahead to our season six premiere and you'll have the usual uh, front five articles and competition updates and such. So in the meantime, don't forget those new links. And I hope you'll keep tabs on all our social media feeds and wherever you are in the world, be sure to enjoy your rugby. Stay safe, everyone. Slan.